stay safe online with Dashlane. More on that later. After World War II, the tension between the two emerging superpowers, the United States and the then Soviet Union, was at an all-time high. The threat of a nuclear war, and sequentially the end of human existence as we know it, was banging on everyone's door. Everyone's life was hanging on by a thread. Neither side wanted to budge, or fall behind the other in fear of losing power completely. Technological development didn't stop with the atom bomb. It continued to get bigger and bigger, like you were rolling a ball of snow down a hill. At the beginning of World War II, we were still using mediocre biplanes. By the end, we had fighter jets, super fortress bombers, new technology. It was like when radio turned to television, a complete shift in focus. It turned from bombs, to chemical warfare, to more biological weapons. Weapons that could enter and change the mind itself. The most dangerous weapon is information. It was rumored that the Nazis near the end of World War II were doing research on the minds and behaviors of humans, and that the secrets and answers to that research lied in the German scientists themselves. Countries such as China, the Soviet Union, and, through the mission codenamed Operation Paperclip, even the United States took former German scientists and engineers back to their own individual countries. The United States was terrified by this. The thought of communist countries researching and developing mind control methods was the worst thing imaginable. The idea of being able to brainwash your citizens, or anyone, into believing in the communist agenda, or any agenda for that matter, is an extreme power. Of course, the solution to this is to just beat the other side to the finish line. And that's exactly what the United States government attempted to do, mainly the CIA. The CIA was created in September of 1947, just a little over two years after the end of World War II. The goal? Gather intelligence, information from both domestic and foreign entities. In a 1951 CIA memo, it expressed the need to explore scientific methods for controlling the minds of individuals. The concerns of a Cold War world run by new Soviet mind control and brainwashing technology was an actual and genuine fear of the United States. Seriously, in an early 1950s CIA document, it states, Hypnotism appears to have been used in some cases by the Soviets. It has the possibilities of lowering resistance against telling the truth, while also being able to induce specific action or behavior in a subject. It is possible for a skilled Russian operator to bring about an interrogation, yet leave the subject with no specific recollection of having been interrogated. The leverage you have for having this kind of power over other humans, whether they be spies, prisoners of war, or even normal citizens, is almost unrivaled. The thing is, this isn't fiction. This isn't some made-up conspiracy theory. There are confirmed facts. In the mid to late 1970s, over 20,000 CIA documents were released regarding the United States' most illegal undertaking. This is the story of how a single government agency planned and attempted to control and alter the minds of those who inhabited the country that they run. How the United States government attempted to develop psychological, biological, and radiological weapons to turn both foreign and domestic spies into sleeper agents. And how it could still be going on today. This is Project MKUltra. And thus, Project MKUltra was born. But MKUltra wasn't just one single project. Look at it as a web of experiments that were all interconnected with one ultimate goal. Control. Project Bluebird, Artichoke, MK Search, and MK Naomi are just to name a few. But it goes much, much further. Although it started earlier, MKUltra was officially signed and begun in 1953 under CIA Director Alan Dulles. It was one of the largest projects ever known. Over 150 subprojects were created and handled by over 80 different institutions, universities, prisons, pharmaceutical companies, all of which who had little to no idea that they were doing work directly for the CIA. However, that didn't stop some of the most creative experiments from taking place. Many of these, as you might imagine, were very, very illegal. American as well as Canadian citizens were unknowingly and unwillingly tested on. Project Artichoke was a sort of continuation of Project Bluebird. Both of these projects focused on hypnosis in many forms. In a 1975 CIA memo, 
artichoke is the study and or use of special interrogation methods and techniques. These methods have been known to include the use of drugs and chemicals, so-called truth serums, hypnosis, and total isolation, a form of psychological harassment. They were looking for ways to control human behavior. These methods were to be used for several different reasons, some to protect against foreign spies, some more disturbing than others. The goal of the research was best defined in a 1954 CIA memo regarding Project Artichoke. It states, Can an individual be made to perform an act of attempted assassination involuntarily under the influence of Artichoke? Artichoke eventually evolved into the more well-known MKUltra, and the sub-projects of MKUltra attempted to find answers to that very question. Subproject 68 is perhaps one of the most illegal of these entire subprojects, but that's not saying much. Both American and Canadian citizens were used as test subjects against their will or knowledge. At the Allen Memorial Institute in Montreal, Dr. Ewan Cameron would lead one of the most twisted projects of the late 1950s and early 1960s. Subproject 68 was fully funded by the CIA, who also paid Dr. Cameron $69,000, or in today's world, nearly $600,000 to carry out secret CIA experiments. Dr. Cameron was heavily interested in being able to erase and reprogram the human mind, and the CIA could obviously use that kind of power in many ways. These experiments would become so severe and damaging that patients who came into the hospital for symptoms such as minor anxiety and depression would leave with their minds fried. They'd experience amnesia, they'd forget how to talk, their brains would be completely wiped, similar to that of a baby. Cameron's patients were subject to some of the most mind-altering drugs and methods known to men. LSD, electroshock therapy at up to 40 times their normal power, drug-induced comas for extended periods of time, and much, much more. Take the case of Linda McDonald, a typical mother who is experiencing the harder parts of being an adult. Depression, physical pain, lack of sleep, and so on. She visits Montreal to be assessed by Dr. Cameron, and almost immediately, he diagnoses her as a schizophrenic, and sends her to what is known today as the sleep room. And this is where it turns bad. Cameron decides to put Linda McDonald into a drug-induced coma for 86 days straight. In the sleep room, patients were often subject to this electroshock therapy, multiple times a day for weeks on end, without any consent. Linda McDonald was subject to over 100 of these shock therapy sessions. As time went on, she went from being able to tell the doctors her name and information about herself to having her brain completely wiped. In a 1998 documentary, she states, I was, had to be toilet trained. I was a vegetable. I had no identity, I had no memory, I'd never existed in the world before. A, like a baby. Just like a baby that... She eventually was dismissed from the hospital and went back home to her family. However, she had no recollection of these people, or even knowledge that these people were even her own family in the first place. This isn't the only case that happened at the Allen Institute, though. Various other cases took place. In many cases, patients would be recorded during therapy sessions talking about their families, or other people, or things that would bring them negative thoughts or have negative impacts on their life. These negative messages would then be cut up and played on repeat for these patients, sometimes over hundreds of thousands of times. This exact thing happened to Robert Logie. He was admitted to the institute for a leg pain, they thought it was all on his head, and he was then sent to the sleep room. He was given LSD every two days, sometimes mixed with other drugs. And then, while in a drug-induced coma, the message, you killed your mother, was repeated to him for 23 days straight. These experiments would take place on all ages, from children to old men and women. Many of the children at this institute were the victims of abuse, and in one case, one of the children were filmed performing sexual acts with multiple government officials as a plot to secure funding for these experiments. Cameron died in 1967 without anyone in the public knowing about what he had been doing for the past decade. Subproject 54 studied techniques to cause concussions and other brain damaging experiments. It was supposed to be handled by the United States Navy. Why? Well, the project was to use suboral frequency blasts to cause concussions. 
and although the program was supposedly never carried out, there is still some evidence that might show some kind of work being done. In the hearings before the Subcommittee on Health and Scientific Research in late September 1977, there's a passage that caught my eye. While talking about funding from various institutes across the country, Dr. Geschichter, a CIA employee, mentions something interesting. He first notes about a study on concussions, where heads of animals were repeatedly rocked back and forth in order to cause concussion and then further amnesia. Next, however, is more interesting. There was apparently a later business, whatever that may be, that through the use of radar, was attempting to put monkeys to sleep. A senator present at the meeting asked, could they? As Dr. Geschichter states, yes, they could. He goes on to say that, it showed if you got into too deep a sleep, you injured the heat center of the brain the way you cook meat, and there was a borderline that made it dangerous. So basically, the CIA was using radio and electromagnetic signals to attempt to put monkeys and other animals to sleep. And they could. Not only that, but they could almost literally cook an animal's brain to the point to where they would go brain dead. And in some cases, even die. Now I don't know about you, but if this could work on monkeys and supposedly other animals as well, I would imagine that this very experiment took place with human subjects as well. The problem is, after this hearing, I couldn't find any other papers or documents that even remotely talked about this sleep experiment. An experiment that seems to have succeeded was washed away and never mentioned again, and the mystery of Subproject 54 fades away. At this point, not much is out of the question when it comes to the links that the CIA would go to in order to conduct their experiments. Operation Midnight Climax was kept relatively a secret up until the mid-1970s. In cities such as San Francisco, California, and New York City, CIA-funded safe houses were built for one specific reason. Prostitution. Well, not exactly that, but prostitutes did have a large role in this operation. These safe houses were often hotel rooms, but not just any normal hotel room. They would be equipped with one-way mirrors so that a person on the outside could see through it, but anyone inside couldn't see out. The CIA would often pay prostitutes in these cities a good bit of cash to bring men back to these hotel rooms so they could be observed. But not normally. After these women would bring men back to the safe house, they would prepare drinks for them. But the women would slyly put LSD in the men's drinks. For hours on end, CIA agents would sit behind these one-way mirrors and observe how the LSD affected these various men, and what kind of information could be extracted from them. These men were never informed or told that they would be taking part in these experiments. There were no doctors present at any of these encounters, just CIA employees sitting back and watching. For the CIA, there's no downside here. They would often pay these prostitutes large sums of money, enough to keep their mouths shut and out of trouble, so no problems would arise there. The men lured back to these hotels were also unlikely to speak out against the things that occurred, and would never know that the CIA was even involved. What are the odds of one of them going to a news outlet, claiming that the CIA drugged them with LSD, and then forced them to follow a prostitute back to a hotel room? Practically zero. It didn't end there. The operation soon expanded, and the CIA began to reach out and dose people in restaurants, bars, and even beaches all of which took place on American citizens who didn't even have the slightest bit of knowledge that they were being experimented on by their own government. On a foggy Wednesday morning in late November of 1953, a group of United States CIA operatives from Camp Dietrich took a weekend getaway to a lake house in Maryland. A little Thanksgiving retreat, we'll call it. The group contained many people, Frank Olson, an army scientist turned CIA employee. Vincent Ruitt, a friend and division chief of Volson. They were also accompanied by Sidney Gottlieb, head of the technical service staff at the CIA, his deputy Robert Lashbrook, and a few others. The three-day getaway was just as normal as any other company getaway can get. Jokes, laughs, good food, and much more. The group of men ate dinner, and then afterwards, they did what men do best. Drink. Two bottles of liquor lie on the table, both the same both indistinguishable from one another. Robert Lashbrook proceeded to pour drinks for eight out of the ten men present, but afterwards, he poured himself and Sidney Gottlieb the same drink, but from the other bottle. 
No one suspected a thing. Besides, liquor is liquor, right? Everyone took the drink. Including Frank Olson. After the trip, life continued on as normal for everyone else. However, for Olson, his life changed drastically. He fell into a deep depression and felt as if his life had no purpose. He had doubts on the work that he was doing. A family man who fell into solitude. Olsen decided that this was enough and met with Vincent Ruin. He said he was dissatisfied with his work and his performance at the retreat. As a top employee at the CIA who happened to be deeply involved with the germ warfare business, he had enough and wanted to devote his life to a completely different field and wanted to resign. Vincent Ruit and Robert Lashbrook both attempted to talk Olsen out of his resignation and suggested him a psychiatrist in New York City. He agreed, and Olsen and Lashbrook set off to New York in hopes of help. The story goes dark here. That is until over 20 years later, when in 1975, the Rockefeller Commission reported on the CIA and its activities within the United States. In this report, it contained many things. 299 pages of information. The CIA engaged in unlawful activities, domestic spying, wiretaps, the use of multiple drugs against unsuspecting US citizens, and much more. It also contained the story of a 1953 CIA experiment on Dr. Frank Olson. At that retreat, Olson was given LSD unknowingly by the CIA supervisors there, Lashbrook and Gottlieb. Their drinks were spiked with LSD while the supervisors observed the results. Just nine days after this incident, Frank Olsen supposedly fell, or jumped, from a 10th story window out of a hotel room in New York City. Olsen's family would never see Frank's body again. He was immediately placed into a casket, taken back to Camp Dietrich, and kept locked up. The story was that his body was too gruesomely injured to be seen, which obviously makes sense. He had a closed casket funeral, and his family would never see him again. That is, until 1993, when Frank's wife died. They were to be buried together, and a second autopsy on Frank Olson's body was performed. The 1953 autopsy stated that there were cuts and abrasions all across Frank's body. However, in a 1994 autopsy, there weren't any to be found. Instead, there were large swellings on Olson's head as well as a large injury on his chest, but not from the fall. It appears that the trauma had occurred before the fall. Again, the difference here between falling and jumping. These are two very different things. This, then, changes it from a suicide to a CIA murder. From falling out of the window to being thrown. The changes in the cover story over the course of 40 years have started to show, and too many questions are being left unanswered. On the night of the incident, Olsen's and Lashbrook's hotel room received a phone call only mere minutes after the event supposedly occurred. A number is dialed, and the person on the other end picks up. Robert Lashbrook is silent, until he breaks it by saying, Well, he's gone. The receiving end replies, That's too bad. The call ends directly after. After doing some research, I found this document that was released with the Rockefeller investigation in 1975. It appears that Lashbrook called Gottlieb before he called the desk, meaning that it was him on the receiving end of that phone call. Sidney Gottlieb's career goes much deeper than just entry-level CIA stuff. He joined the CIA in 1951 as a poisons expert. As an experienced chemist, Gottlieb was very involved with preparing lethal poisons and other mind-bending drugs. He eventually became known as the Black Sorcerer and the Dirty Trickster, and eventually became head of a secret, previously undisclosed government project, MKUltra. Over the course of his career, he devised plans on killing multiple large foreign government officials. He proposed multiple ways of attempting to kill Fidel Castro. These include poison cigars, exploding conch shells, and much more. So the thought of him being involved in a domestic homicide definitely isn't out of the picture. Seymour Hirsch was a journalist who was deeply involved with this story for decades. After his years of research, in 2017, he said the government had a security process that would allow them to identify and execute domestic citizens who posed a risk. Olson is believed to have fallen under this category, and the CIA and other government agencies have been covering it up all along. If this is true, 
and the US government considered an accidental death resulting from illegal human experimentation to be a better cover story than the actual truth. And I honestly can't tell you which story sounds worse. On top of that, after looking at the CIA's 1953 A Study of Assassination, which, let's be honest, is basically the CIA's assassination manual. It even has a section for this very incident, with the title, Accidents. The most efficient accident in simple assassination is a fall of 75 feet or more onto a hard surface. Elevator shafts, stairwells, unscreened windows, and bridges will serve. This wasn't about the LSD, it was about biological warfare, about interrogation, getting a means to an end. The LSD and other drugs were just a cover story to get people to look in the wrong direction. Look over here so you won't ask questions about the other stuff, the deeper reasons behind it all. The Olsen family had become pretty much celebrities, and there's no way you could just take them all out of the picture without anyone asking questions. While they were out researching and diving into the story, the CIA and other agencies were just playing the long game, until everyone involved with it faded out of existence. The events of Project MKUltra are an enigma. Almost all of the records were destroyed in 1973 by Richard Helms, the director of the CIA at the time. Every bit of information we have today is just a fragment of the entire picture. But from what we have, obvious claims about the ethics of the entire project can be made. However, even the declassified, released documents could just be another cover story. All of those documents, although still pretty disturbing, could just be like the Olsen family, a distraction from what was really going on. Also, just like Project Bluebird that turned into Project Artichoke, all they did was reskin the previous project into a new one. It's more than possible, and I think very likely, that the same thing happened here. All of the documents we have today are just the tip of the iceberg, while a much bigger story lies beneath. Many news sources you see will say that MKUltra ended in 1964, but funding continued throughout the 1970s under projects called MK Search and MK Often, which study things that I don't even want to talk about. All I'm saying is, whether you consider it a conspiracy theory or fact, more and more findings seem to keep showing their face. It's entirely possible that these projects never ended, and that the research that dominated the second half of the 20th century still continues on to this very day. This almost 70 year long deep rooted mystery may never truly be resolved. As I said at the start of the video, it's all about control. If you have control, you have power. And power is irreplaceable. Imagine having access to the entire population of a country, having access to every launch code and password imaginable at the press of a button. The amount of information you would hold is limitless. Now more than ever, it's important to take charge of your digital identity. And with Dashlane, that's possible. With Dashlane, you don't have to worry about being tracked or having anyone get into your accounts. Dashlane can help bring you peace of mind in these situations through securely managing your digital identity. The easiest way to stay safe online is to use different passwords for almost every account you have. However, this is impossible to track, and chances are you'll forget most of them. Dashlane gives you access to a service that generates and stores nearly unhackable passwords with the click of a button. It also provides autofill across forms online, dark web monitoring, and a VPN. Dashlane works on almost every single device you can think of, including mobile devices. It's honestly the easiest way to protect yourself from big data breaches, personal account hacks, and complex online scams. They even let you know when a breach happens so you can change your password as soon as possible and protect yourself even more. If you have a bad or easily hackable password, they'll tell you and help you create a new one in just seconds. Dashlane is completely free to use, so get 30 days of free protection by visiting dashlane.com aperture. Then, after you test the waters, if you'd like to use the VPN or dark web monitoring, upgrade to the premium version by using promo code aperture for 10% off. You'll be protecting yourself and supporting me at the same time. Stay safe.